so that there are people who can deliver the good to different players, so that they can come in the same level to different players, so that people with different grades and understanding can understand the same point. I mean, all the rest are all the equal systems. Unfortunately, we are putting together the fight time or the minimum level to do so, but without actually investing in creating the core content and in creating people who can articulate the core content with conviction, clarity, and confidence. As far as I am concerned, you should invest in what some of the data require as mandatory education. As long as you pay to do that, you will continue to have this discussion that I said last year as well for another 20 years to come and there is nothing that you will achieve. If authority you are not in a position to order the presentation of history or the presentation of facts to the nation, you need to find other ways. If it is possible for students to think of their regular time as a sound and focus on coaching centers, is it not possible for us to think of alternative media, alternative channels to convey the same messages? Are we going to keep waiting for that one bright sunny day of the year out of the horizon to say, now we will change the narrative of the sun? There is so much more of the sun to say, I will be able to ask what to change the narrative of the sun. What is ever going to happen? So, why am I part of this particular issue? One thing that I learned from is the bulk of the initiatives in every center is driven by private initiative. It is driven by private enterprise. It is driven by private entrepreneurship. So I can continue to expect the state to give you the working time that you see. We must find solutions from within the society for the private initiative. Unless and until we do that, this imposed sense of Maya mentality under 1991 goes beyond the economic sector and it has affected our other sector also, where it constantly impacts the government. Any government, regardless of who is in power, is ultimately going to play a passive in the election if it is a power game. Therefore, in order for you to become attractive to them, you need to become an incentive for them to invest in you. So, invest in yourself first before you expect others to invest in you. So, as far as I am concerned, get your facts right, invest in true public education, invest in the future, and then go for some change. Until then, why you can go from one studio to another, one delivery test to another, one circuit to another. There is a recent chance that people like me would have filled their heads by going from one place or another and coming to ways of paths. And as individuals, you may have been a benefit. I am not sure how the paths are going to be going to be there. So, which is one of the reasons that politicians can decide to cut down the team of science and focus on keeping my head up. And tell you the good for the ground and I am a qualified person. If I am a qualified lawyer, my training as a family person teaches me to keep my mouth shut on the aspects of which I am not qualified to speak on. And to listen to people who are better qualified to speak on the practice of it and understand it. Whenever I come to speak on something about everything and I have seen comments and videos, most people see it fast. What if I wanted to ask her away now? Sorry, I suck it and I don't know. I have no right to ask her, I have no right to speak her, I am absolutely okay in any of these thoughts ever. The only thing that I perhaps have is intuitively I have a pulse of culture as a consequence of my upbringing, as a consequence of my training, as a child, as a simplicity of others, or whatever the right is. And there is a sense of received wisdom whose value I do not articulate before, but perhaps I am in a better position to articulate today and if I wish to pass on to the next generation. 
the government is exceedingly independently centered for you. I want the next generation to have the benefit of what I have received and to see value in the way I have and perhaps more. So, words say management are sexy, they're manners. They perhaps end up putting a certain cause on the pedestal. But you scratch the surface and ask the question, what does it mean? I'm not sure many would be in a position to answer the question. And you have concrete solutions to real problems facing our society and our country. Thank you. I think uh, we can start our uh, discussion session with you only because you uh, brought out something very nice. You said that uh, it is not necessary to know any Vedas and Shastra as long as you have the culture. The culture. I think this is what uh, the vast majority of uh, people actually do. So, uh, with reference to your experience of the Shabri Malar case, would you like to tell us how this spirit can be made to rub on the people who actually decide these matters? Uh, there I would completely agree with what Dr. Raju said. You can't fill a cup or a vessel which is already full. Particularly if it is full of material which is the, uh, the exact anathematic matter to yours. If your matter and it's antimatter, I don't know how you're going to fill it up. I'll give you a, sing a simple example. If you look at the earlier decisions, and this is something that I've always said, and, and pardon me for saying so, I completely disagree with a lot of people on their take of the constitution. Not because I'm a constitutional patriot. I'm a dharmic patriot who believes in the constitution because it is a product of the will of the people. That's how I see it. The tendency that our side has always shown, if at all there is our side, I still don't know because our side is the first one to take pot shot at our people, which is the constitution is an anti-Hindu document. Achha, so that is the constitution which speaks of cow protection. Thank you. Okay. The constitution is a document which has created this entire apartheid against Hindus. Sorry. The moment you start looking at the constitution or any book in that particular direction, your mind is automatically close to any solutions that can come from that book. Then you have no idea how to use the book to further your interests or agenda. Until it is changed, that book is the one that is effectively going to decide your destiny and your future. If that is the case, and your mind has already created a block in your head which is to say, I cannot get any solution from that book because it is against me, then you have effectively lost the battle. Then what are you doing in court? <laughs> There's not a single legal or a constitutional battle that you can hope to win at all. And for a community that takes such pride in its argumentative nature, its tarkic heritage, its philosophical leanings and its power of reasoning and logic, you can't seem to find a solution in that book then don't call yourself the progeny of people like Shankaracharya or the descendants of people like Shankaracharya because you've given up on that. Now to answer your question, if you look at the judgments of the 50s and 60s and 70s, you had judges who were trained in the Shastras, who were Sanskrit scholars like Patanjali Shastri, Rajagopal Iyengar. These were people who had their pulse on the tradition apart from being, scho being scholars in that particular tradition. So when a practice or a religious practice, particularly a dharmic practice is placed before them, their lens is not jaundiced. Their lens is clear in being able to separate diversity from discrimination. But when you already have a certain repository of basic conditioning, which is not dharmic, I'm not necessarily going to call it anti-dharmic, it is a dharmic, if not necessarily a dharmic, 
then obviously you will continue to apply that very same conditioning to every practice that comes before you and there is a confirmation bias which tells you this is the conclusion and I will find a reason to achieve that conclusion regardless of what the facts are. So if the ground is not fertile to receive a certain idea, keep throwing facts at it, it's not going to make any use, it's not going to make any difference, any smidgen of difference, any scintilla of difference. So that means we are failing or we have failed to invest in creating members of the judiciary from their days as law students who understand Hindu law, who understand Hindu practices, who have read P. V. Kanye's Dharma Shastras, who have gone beyond that and have read the primary sources. So what is the point of blaming the judiciary when you have failed to create people who are in a position to defend your interests and your, and, and your practice? So invest in educating, invest in rearming before Trishul Dan, start with Gyan Dan. That would, that's what I would say. Very well answered. But uh, also when people start, when the uh, judges start quoting from the American Constitution and do not refer to the Constituent Assembly debates, which itself is a repository of great knowledge, and uh, they start quoting uh, and uh, this great uh, depository of uh, debates, which is the Constituent Assembly debates. I, uh, of course, <clears throat> I do have some exposure to law practice because law is practiced in my house. But uh, I see very, very few students and judges even reading the constituent assembly debates. And that is why you come to a situation where uh, uh, Maoist scholars are being quoted, the American constitution is being quoted, and that is being done uh, in cases which relate to traditional Indian practices. Now, as you yourself said, that you keep, can keep throwing facts, this is not going to uh, have any effect. Then, where are we heading? So, the thing is, when they call themselves constitutional patriots, they are right, we have not understood them. They have not said which constitution they are being patriotic to, no. So, we have assumed that they are patriotic to the Indian constitution, that is our fault. They never said we are Indian constitutional patriots. Okay. Secondly, here is where the chicanery lies which is, the constitution cannot be treated like any other statute is one basic assumption. And therefore they say, it must be a document which must be relevant to the times we live in and therefore its interpretation must be fluid. Somewhat like the definition of narrative that Dr. Raju gave. In which case, how did you arrive at a basic structure of the constitution? How did you fix in time and freeze for all times to come certain parts of the constitution? So there is a problem there. Second, when you say that it has to be a fluid interpretation and it needs to change with time, the curious part is if the times you live in and the values you subscribe to are not Indian values, then the interpretation also is not going to be Indian in nature, regardless of what the Constitution Assembly debates have said. So that is where society's progression and its cultural values and its traits start affecting judicial interpretation. Point number two, so much of time was spent in trying to equate the practice at Sabrimala with untouchability, the original form of untouchability as it was prax practiced. And if you look at the constant assembly debates, this discussion was clearly, uh, it, it took place, which is if you do not define untouchability, then any form of ritual untouchability, which is to say that somebody has a bath, comes out and doesn't want to touch anybody else before they approach the puja room, will also be treated as untouchability and therefore it could be penalized. This argument was made. Therefore they said, let's limit it to caste-based untouchability or sect-based untouchability. And all other uh, amendments which were sought to be made to expand the definition were not rejected or accepted, but Dr. Ambedkar chose not to take a call on it 
And he simply, so if you look at Article 17, it has led only to a legislation that deals with caste-based untouchability. There's no other history of it at all. Now, what has happened in the judgment is, Ambedkar's silence, get this for a moment, Ambedkar's silence in neither accepting nor rejecting has been interpreted as his endorsement. We have gone to that level now. So what has happened is, we will now project our perceptions, our ideological notions on the past as well as the present, as well as the future and present it to the society as constitutional morality and say this is sacrosanct. So as far as I'm concerned, the solution does not come only from the judiciary. It needs to come from the society because the kind of people you throw up are the kind of people who end up occupying these positions. So, so Dr. Raju, can we say that the Supreme Court is now the new Christian God? The Supreme Court is now the new Christian God? The God? What I have said is that uh, we never really compared the indigenous uh, legal systems with the current British system. So the British system doesn't really work. Uh, the British system, legal system doesn't really work. And we are saying that. And if you look at it in contrast, let us say, uh, you know, the uh, uh, chap who built this Purana Kila, he hung a uh, bell outside because uh, the Faryadi must get insaf instantly, otherwise the cosmic order will be disturbed. Now, when does any of these courts give us <laughs> insaf immediately? <laughs> they will give it in 100 years or 200 years or some time scheme like that. So, we never really compared the two and we were pushed into that. Now, had uh, maybe Mahatma Gandhi lived, uh, we may have had a different constitution. But I think this is something which needs to be considered and which you have not considered. You just accepted whatever was Western was good and that is a big problem. Would you like to add to it? Okay, so I will now take up questions and before taking up the questions because we have the system of giving the uh, best question award, I would request uh, Sushil Pandit and Rajiv Lala to please form this jury and judge the questions. You can sit together if you like. Now the first question, a very long one. If you send very long questions, I may not take up. I'll take this up later. Now this question is by Shakti Balan. Shakti Balan, can you please stand up? Shakti Balan or Balan? Okay, okay. So this is question is probably to Dr. C.K. Raju, it is not mentioned. There are many instances about the facts that are hidden behind the narratives that becomes popular. What can be a solution for this? There are many. May I take a look at the question? Yeah. I don't quite understand the question. You are saying that there are facts hidden inside the narrative and that by uh, telling the narrative, you are somehow privileging certain facts. Is that the question? Is that the question? Okay. So, yes, I agree. I agree that uh, when you tell a narrative, it assumes a lot of facts. For example, when you tell the narrative of Euclid and say that uh, Greeks did a better kind of geometry, uh, the, it hides a number of facts. But then the solution to that is you point out the real facts. 
So you say there wasn't Euclid, he did not, or whatever the book elements, did not uh, do geometry in the way it was supposed to do. So the facts are contrary to the narrative. That's a very simple solution. But then you have to research and not get carried away by the narrative flow. You have to look at the facts. Stop yourself, look, is this true, is this true, is this true? You ask of every question, be, uh, of every statement, be utterly skeptical and then you can arrive at the truth. Is that a reasonable solution for you? Okay, I ask, there, is, there are two questions by Ashwanya Shukla. Where are you? Yeah, I will take only one. You have written very long questions. Ashwanya. What's, what's your name? Ashwanya? Ashwarya. Okay. Uh, this is to Dr. Parikshit Singh. Uh, there is a bit of rhetoric, I will pass that. With beliefs so strongly rooted today, how would you say the best way forward is to develop a habit of civil discourse? That is the challenge of the day. We have uh, very strong beliefs. Some, and whenever we people, people have beliefs, it is a, an out... It's a product of the ego. It's a product of certain inferiority complex. It's a product of not understanding the issues completely. At, as uh, C.K. Rajuji pointed out, when you're dealing with facts, and if you're truly de dealing with facts, beliefs really fall off. So to understanding our dharma is we don't believe. Uh, belief is a, again a Western concept. I tell you to believe in a God outside and now you start believing in and that God told you what to do and how to live and you start believing in and now because of this manner you're going to follow this, this, this way. So that's belief. Uh, the, uh, the way at least our dharma was approached was through a deep understanding, actually questioning and uh, what is called the negative thinking as what Krishnamurti called negative thinking is to reject, eliminate, this is not true, this is not true. So whatever comes through, whatever is left has nothing to do with belief. The Indian term for belief would probably be Shraddha, but Shraddha is not belief. Shraddha is a deep experience. It comes from a Sanskrit, two Sanskrit roots, Shra and Dha. Dha is what holds, what keeps you together. Dharma, what holds you together. So that requires a deep understanding of who this I is, who oneself is. Once you understand that, you'll have an automatic Shraddha for what holds you. That is Swadharma, understanding who oneself is. Now. When the belief system here is so strong, how do you fight it? Personally, go deeper. Uh, understand what uh, our dharma is, what uh, our darshan is. And understanding that deeply, living it that deeply, you'll realize that your belief actually turns into shraddha, which is real, alive, which is based on truth. How do you influence others? Uh, we talked about ecosystems, we talked about narratives, that's one attempt to change it. I feel when people are so entrenched, it is going to be very difficult. Then we go beyond the narrative. Then we create the platform on which this narrative is run. Um, I think this is a platform where such a narrative can be run. But a platform that is open, I would where discourse happens according to the rules of that platform, um, where that platform itself is a shift from hard and fast belief systems into an open discourse. For example, and I know I'm not an expert in these debates that you have on Republic TV and all that, and you may like Arnab and you may like some of his ideas, which are 
I can agree with them. But the way they are discussed is not a way to eliminate belief. The way they are discussed is it, your belief will become stronger and my belief is strong. I'm not listening to you, I'm only listening to myself. In fact, I won't even allow you to speak. And I'll cut you off. It's not only bad manners, it's there's no way you're going to change the other person. Right? So, this whole mode, modus operandi is, is false. How do we create that? That you will have to cre uh, think of uh, a civil discourse, a social discourse, where we can really come together, where only a manner of communication is allowed, where people are open-minded. But then you also have to be strong enough to take that to influence the whole society. That will require a lot of intelligence. I keep getting reminded of Krishnamurti when someone asked him, actually I think it was Indira Gandhi who asked him, I'm riding a tiger, how do I get off? We are all riding the tiger. And the common concept is you cannot get off the tiger. And Krishnamurti's answer was very simple. He says it all depends on who is more intelligent, you or the tiger. So if you're intelligent, you'll figure out a way to get off the tiger. I don't know if I've answered your question, but to get out of the belief paradox and paradigm, you'll have to use tremendous in intelligence. Next question is to Shefali ji. I'm making an exception in case of Ashwanya because this is a good question. So, I'm taking a second question from her, which I normally don't do. So, this question is, pushback also gives rise to strict and harsh, harsh measures sometimes. So, what would you say are the best means of pushback? Can I read it, please? There's a lot of echo. Uh, it's a very good question. What would I say are the best means to push back? It actually depends from individual to individual. It depends on what are your strengths and how best you think you can push back. The way I push back is by constantly trying to correct the narrative. It may work, it may not work, but that's my way of pushing back. If I find something that's wrong or erroneous that's being put out, I do not keep quiet, I speak up and I try to put the facts out there. And my style is, again, it's, it's something intrinsic to me. So how you push back is really up to you. But it's important to push back. And when I say push back, don't uh, literally take it as, you know, the harshest way of uh, you being rude to somebody or whatever. What I'm saying is many times we keep quiet when something is wrong. Especially, in, I've seen this happen in our family WhatsApp groups or whatever. You find some information being circulated. You do not agree with it, you know it's wrong. But half the time you say, oh, I, this has been spread by somebody I know, why should I speak up, why should I, you know, put my neck out there and say this is wrong. So even if we know it's wrong, we just keep quiet. I'm saying don't do that. It is important if you believe in something and if you feel that a na wrong narrative is being pushed, it's important to assert yourself and it's important to say this is wrong and this is why I think it's wrong. That is your way of pushing back. It's different for everybody. I, I want to divert here a little bit. Uh, uh, Mr. Dikshit said, uh, talk about me too. Now I find it very strange that just because I'm a woman, I'm supposed to be talking about me too. Is me too really only a woman's issue? It's an issue that affects all of us, right? I'm happy that women are speaking up. But why should I be the only one among this entire uh, very erudite panel speaking about me too? Just because I have two XX chromosomes? XX only, no? My science is not very good, but... So, if... I mean, this is something that we can all push back, right? Why just me? Why me? Very good point. Just to add to what uh, Shefali ji was saying. After the 377 judgment, the permutations and combinations have only increased. So I'm completely with you. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is to, is to Dr. C.K. Raju. Uh, how facts can contribute 
to integrate the cultural and civilizational aspect to form a common narrative India. Yeah, I mean, that is the sum and substance of that question. Uh, can I have the name of the... Pardon me? Name of the... Name question. of the person by Aditi Agarwal. Aditi Agarwal. Yes, 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 please. Right. So, um, how facts can constitute in integrating the cultural and civilizational aspect from a common narrative of India, because nowadays culture of left, culture is left behind in our run for civilizational development. Today we can be civilized but not cultural at all. Well, first of all, these uh, terms, culture and civilization, in this kind of discourse have a certain specific technical meaning. So if you see, the term culture was used by Spengler in his decline of the West. And later on, the term was changed to civilization by Toynbee, who wrote his, uh, you know, voluminous history, where he linked civilization with religious beliefs, with a church, with a universal church. And there wasn't a universal church in India, but uh, he force-pitted it into that. So I think that you, first of all, need to differentiate between these terms, and because civilization was also the term picked up by Huntington, who then started this clash of civilizations thesis as a strategic answer to the post-Cold War uh, strategic scenario, instead of uh, you know, looking at nuclear weapons and so on, you look at culture and civilization. So now when you're talking about a common narrative, my question when I was talking about grand narrative was why do you need a common narrative? When we talked of PHISPC, the project, there is a plurality of narratives. So why do you need a common narrative? That is imitation of the West. You know, they have a narrative because they had a church. And the church told everybody what to think. Now, when you have a common narrative, the question is, it is a common narrative against whom? Please don't forget that. Because if it's a common narrative, if I'm talking about, you know, you think about not only all human life, you think of all life in the cosmos. So it is not against anybody. But if you are talking about something specifically for India, you are leaving somebody out and see what the church did. What it did was that it said, you kill all the people. Why do you think all the Red Indians were killed? Why do you think all the Maya were killed? Why do you think the Inca were killed? Why do you think the Maori were killed? Why do you think the Australian Aborigines were killed? Why do you think that blacks were made slaves? Now I regard that as extremely evil. It was an extremely evil thing to do to kill so many people. It cannot be dharma by any standards. So if we are talking about a narrative, you please keep that in mind. We don't want the narrative to lead us to adharma. We are talking of common narrative against whom? Commonality of what? Commonality of all human beings or only commonality of Indians? Because the church saw political advantage in that in excluding all non-Christians. The way a state excludes all non-citizens gives some rights to them and does not give rights to non-citizens. So, what is that common narrative that you are talking about? Because otherwise, you can have a multiplicity of narratives just as you have a multiplicity of ways of uh, achieving moksha. You, know, you could go Hat Yoga way, you could go Raj Yoga way, you could go any way you like. You could even try Bhakti. So, there isn't that sort of common narrative is not a fundamental requirement unless you want to gang up against somebody. Great answer, great answer. May I add, may I add something? So, dharma is never against anyone, if I may add to that. Swadharma is never against someone. Light is never against dark. Light is itself. And when light is there, the darkness will go away. Sim the, I'm just taking that uh, previous question from Aishwarya 
what is the way to push back and which was and what is the way to change the belief system um, you have to find that inner strength which can come out something like what the Buddha did it has to be very silent it has to be very insistent persistent systematic methodical what we call in management the smack principle don't get any ideas from the word smack but that's what it's called smack systematic methodical and uh, comprehensive.